Welcome into the Living Room Disciple podcast. Today we're asking the question, should Christians want to change the world or is there a better way? Don't forget you can always support us on Patreon by visiting our website livingroomdisciple.com and we are so glad that you're tuned in today as we dive into a big question that hopefully has a small answer of being faithful to the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. As always, thank you for joining us on this episode of the Living Room Disciple Podcast, where discipleship finds a home. All right, Nick. So I've been growing in (laughs) self-awareness. Always a good thing. (laughs) And one of the things I think I've learned about myself, specifically over the last maybe like three, four years, is I like I I check off a lot of millennial categories mm. like pretty hardcore. I'm wearing flannel currently. Okay. Yeah. Avocado and toast is one of my favorites. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I I'm my children are growing up to Harry Potter. Uh, yeah. Or at least you know on the movies or whatever. And I'm like, man, I'm just I am a millennial. And one of the areas though of uh, maybe me being confronted with my millennial millennialism. Millennialness. Millennialness. <laughs> <laughs> I was reading um, Culture Making, um, Recovering Our Creative Calling. And it's a bit of an older book. Like it comes from like 2007. One of his major like metaphors in the whole book is MySpace. That's not a joke. Nice. <laughs> and absolutely fantastic book. Andy Crouch is just such a wonderful thinker and a blessing to me. But in the book, he confronts our sometimes hubris or desire to change the world Mm. and it like kind of hurt me and my soul because i realized one of the other areas of millennialism that i fall into is man i i grew up in a disney generation and i really did believe that just because i was one of seven billion people on earth didn't didn't change the fact that like i have the potential to like Mm radically change the world and i've grown up i mean in my 30s now still kind of struggling with this impulse to have a world changing impact right so for the person listening to this i would ask the question what's wrong with wanting to change the world isn't that a good thing right like the world is uh, it appears pretty hopelessly broken it looks like it needs a lot of help What's wrong if some good-hearted, good-intentioned people come along and say, I'm here to change the world? Yeah. And that's kind of what I thought. (laughs) I was like, why is this a problem? Yeah. And uh, both through the book and through my own kind of like personal reflection, um, I think just like a lot of stuff that we talk about, it's less about that thing being Mm -hmm. a problem and more about what happens when you take that thing to its truest and kind of fullest extent yeah and i think it's when you you extrapolate it out that you start running into issues interesting and i think square one is with what you define as the world and i think we should start there okay how do you define the world well i think traditionally growing up i thought about it as the world right <laughs> so, you know it's so eight whatever billion people mm-hmm. uh and i wanted to uh make a positive this is where the good intention is a positive impact for every single one of those humans walking around you know whether that was through amazing you know policy changes or inventions or producing writing a book or producing podcasts whatever it is that ev- somehow every person right. you know and really we're living in a time where it's probably more common than ever for individuals to change the world with the invention of computers and internet yeah. and facebook and myspace and you know mm-hmm. um all the different ways that the world has has changed rapidly mm-hmm. by the innovations of a select few yep. um, so yeah, we're living in a time where that's probably more in the air even than when we were growing up with kind of the Disney generation idea. And yet, even now, it's still impractical to think that you're going to affect every person right. on earth, even right. in a meaningful way. And, you know, even Facebook hasn't affected every, I mean, and you can make an argument that it's indirectly affected every person, you right. know, of course, right? But generally speaking, not every person on earth has had interactions with Facebook. And just because you've affected doesn't mean you've positively affected and doesn't even necessarily mean you've meaningfully changed. Right. 
So I think step one is, is like where our definition is, because as we think about it from this big global perspective, um, especially myself and I think generally people coming from my generation, our generation, we, we have this notorious way of, you know, I'll just use this example. We have this notorious like uh, feeling that we should feed like hungry children in Africa and we should. And we like just don't consider the foster care problem in our own city. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I may have, I, I, I'm pretty sure I do I have children who are in and out of foster care with probably on my own street. Um, and yet I might become more familiar with the social and economic issues that are creating, you know, problems for right. children outside of my own country. And so this idea of wanting to change the world because it's the world is defined as this thing that really I can't actually hold it in my imagination in its truest, honest form. I just have like my own picture of what that is. Um, I end up aiming and missing mm. and, or not even, not even considering the world that is the community I'm in, which I think is what Andy Crouch began uh, kind of shaping in my mind is redefining when I see change the world. It's really honing in and, and moving my emphasis and my uh, calling and purposing towards changing my community. Right. You know, and even bringing that to like the smallest form of like my sphere of influence, the people yeah. who I can love and serve and those kind of things. <clears throat> yeah, no doubt. So, so you're saying that we shouldn't give up on trying to make a positive inf- impact. That's not the goal here, but the goal is kind of shortening our thinking or bringing our thinking closer to home, um, Mm -hmm. where rather than, I mean, Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, quoting Leviticus, love your neighbor as yourself, right? Um, And of course, they didn't have the kind of global awareness that we have today. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the same time, it's kind of this, you know, love the person next door to you um, idea. So bringing, bringing the love of your neighbor home rather than Mm -hmm. trying to stretch it out and and, you know you walk by the the homeless person you walk by somebody who's struggling on your street um and maybe pay no mind to them but then when somebody gives Mm -hmm. a a moving speech or you see a a heartfelt commercial that that asks you to donate to the relief on the other side of the world which is not a bad thing no it's Um, a really good thing but of course we should be loving our literal Mm -hmm. neighbors as ourselves it's a pretty direct command in scripture right um and so tell tell me some ways that as you've thought about this what are some ways that have come to mind for you um that we can be better at loving the people in front of us rather than just thinking about i want to have this change the world kind of impact yeah well i think i I think a lot of ideas come to mind once you start saying like i no longer am feeling like i need to change the world but instead like how can I impact? And when you talk about the difference between change and impact in a moment, mm. but when we talk about like, how can I have an impact on my local community? Because it's just a lot more doable, but also it emphasizes depth over breadth. Mm. You know, I think each of us only has so much capacity. Like if you thought about us as like water in a mug, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and we all have a pretty equivalent capacity, you know, we're restricted by 24 hours in the day and our own human lifespans, let alone like our limits for intellectual capacity, emotional intelligence, so on and so forth. So we only have so much, you know, and even if our cups vary, they vary marginally. Yeah. And so when you try to have a massive impact, you just end up spreading that water over a little, you know, over a wide kind of area. And you, you really don't change anybody's life in a meaningful way, you know, very few, if any, you can even look at like major social influencers um, who have, you know, t- tens of millions of followers, like have, you know, has Mr. Beast or whoever you know, <laughs> had a meaningful impact on every one of his followers. Probably not. You know, he's created moments of entertainment on a fairly regular basis. And that's about it. <clears throat> You know, he may have had really deep impacts in certain individuals. I, you know, I want to give him credit, you know, in, in those videos, but, um, but the wider audience is shallow. So when I start thinking about my community, though, I can suddenly add depth and, and we get closer to change. Right. And this could be um, befriending um, someone in my community who I know um, doesn't have intimate relationship. Um, but this can also be through providing financial support for one or two people. Um, where, you know, maybe, uh, in my home and, and through my income, we can 
provide marginal, but for that individual, major financial support through relationship, um, you, you know, sending a bunch of people $20 is helpful and loving, but ongoing supporting, you know, maybe a, a single mother with, you know, a few hundred dollars. Right. Um, I mean, that's light. That is literally life changing, right. right? You're not changing the world, but you're changing that individual on a right. really, uh, at least their financial uh, life, which could be leveraged to, to having bigger change. <clears throat> so I think for me, uh, it, it, I mean, I just use a few of my examples, creating relationship. Yeah. Um, with people, I'm, I'm kind of learning more and more and reflecting a lot that loneliness seems to be one of the biggest um, issues. And even in my local community, I've seen the statistics for years, but I think it isn't until recently that I've started to realize how many people I, I work alongside or go to church with who are experiencing pretty extreme loneliness. So relationally, uh, investing a significant amount of time mm. and changing somebody's world and, and letting them feel valued financially investing into people um, as often as I can, sometimes contributing to organizations, but trying to take my money and put it into yeah. individuals, bank accounts to have a big change on them. I think those are the two that are sticking out to me the most. I don't know if you've got any to add to that. To yeah, that list. Well, I think the testimony of scripture would, would bring you to the conclusion. If you, if you just sat down and read the entire thing, maybe over a month or something, um, I think you would come to the conclusion if you were looking for it that m major change is paradoxically somehow brought mm. upon by small yes. small gifts to to small you know small investments and small returns um to use to use probably a very not helpful economic metaphor yeah um but I'm I've, track with you I'm thinking of the the parable of the kingdom of God as like a mustard seed right mm -hmm. like you put this tiny thing in the dirt and just leave it there mm -hmm. water it let sunlight come and it turns into this blossoming tree for the birds to, to nest in. Um, and, and yeah, I think it's the, the small, the small things that we put into individuals, not thinking or, or families or small communities or local communities, not thinking I'm going to change the world with this, but just thinking I'm going to do the right thing and I'm going to serve Jesus, um, as our motivation. And we can yeah. talk in a minute about how we're formed differently by I'm going to do the right thing and serve Jesus and be loyal to Jesus versus I'm going to go out and change the world. Like yeah. how much more is that about me and what, what change I can bring versus I'm just going to do the right thing and be loyal to Jesus. Cause this is about him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it strikes me that your example of if you give a few hundred dollars to a single mom, mm -hmm. um, rather than, you know, $20 spread out to a lot of people that you can really form a relationship with that single mom mm -hmm. where you can ask her how she is. You can offer to watch her kids when she needs mm -hmm. to work the late shift, right? Like there are so many ways that you can impact mm -hmm. her in, in more ways than just financially that that's impossible. If you respond to a, a red cross commercial and, and you send money overseas that like, that's a beautiful gift, but it's, it's, there's no way for you to practically be in the person's life. That's going to receive that gift. One of the issues that I have too, and, and it, it's almost like a an attribution to the, the mindset that I've grown up with and fostered for so long is like, so, you, so let's take the, just the, the example of the single mom who where, you know, we invest in and develop a relationship with there's this normal, like mental justification that I then want to start creating around why that's a good thing. And it, it goes something like, because then her life can be changed and then mm. her children's life can be changed. Uh, yeah. And yeah, then, yeah. you know, and you want to start like extrapolating that into now I've really just changed the world, you know? I, yeah. And, right. And it's, and I think what ends up happening, and one of the reasons that when I think about this idea of being people who want to go and to change the world, I'm seeing this is probably not a healthy spiritual thing, is because it does the exact opposite of what you were just talking about. It removes the emphasis from obedience to Christ, and it moves that emphasis to results as yeah. indicated by what I think is a, a good result. Right. And it's, it just honestly sets the bar at a bar that only God could do, yeah. which I think a lot of people would say, yes, I want the Lord to change the world through me, right? And I know mm -hmm. it's only he can do it. But, but the problem is, is he doesn't want to use you. Mm -hmm. He wants to use the church collectively mm -hmm. as an organization, a group of people, uh, a family of citizens who belong to a already not yet kingdom. That's what he wants to use to change yeah. the world. He just doesn't want to use Phil Snyder or, or Nick O'Brien. Uh, he wants to take that and, and use 
Bill Snyder, Nick O'Brien, and millions of other people and say, hey, live in a loving community that represents the kingdom that's to come. And as you live in that loving community, inviting people to enter into that community, I may or may not change the world to reflect the values that we know are coming because that ultimate world change is not coming until I I say it's coming. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the other thing too, is like, um, so, okay. So a few things we define the world, um, in this big thing that our imaginations can't even hold. So when we define as community, we start moving from, uh, breadth, just a lot of, you know, a lot of little impact, a shallow effect to depth where we have intimate, deep impact on a smaller number of people. We show people value and we become very person focused versus being like, you know, numbers on a screen focused. Right. And then we move to obedience over Christ versus like getting the results that make me feel good, which mm-hmm. honestly in 2023 usually results in dopamine hits on likes of videos yeah, or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, thinking that we're changing, like, I, I hope, I don't think either one of us think that we're changing the world with our podcast <laughs> yeah, or, even, right. or even on no. a path, no. <laughs> right? We hope that we maybe have a positive impact on one or two people, and, uh, which is great. Um, but we can't lean into, you know, what metrics show success per se, you know? Mm-hmm. And okay. So then the, there's also this level of, we forget about the kingdom to come. And I think that's something, I don't think any crowd really talked about it in his book, but, but his book really inspired those thoughts in me. And I've just kind yeah. of dwelling on oh, We've been reading a lot of stuff this last year uh, that has really emphasized and having a lot of conversations that really emphasize the kingdom element yeah. of our walk with Jesus. And it's one of my favorite conversations with you. And I've been thinking like, oh man, like when I want to write this amazing book that's going to change the world or give this amazing sermon that's going to change the world or found this organization that's going to change the world or start the podcast that's going to change the world. I have removed my eyes from the kingdom that's to come. Absolutely. And that cannot lead, even if it's good intentioned. Yeah. That can't lead me in a good direction. Right. Yeah. If you read all the references to the kingdom of God in the New Testament, it's never once it's your job to build the kingdom of God. That's Mm -hmm. the word build is not used with the kingdom of God um, because that's not our responsibility. We are called to be ambassadors of the kingdom Mm -hmm. of God, citizens of heaven, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Or of the kingdom of heaven. And I'm just thinking of Paul's metaphor of the body of Christ Mm -hmm. and Christ ascends to the father and then says the spirit has filled y'all as a community. You now are the body of Christ. And like you said, um, Nick O'Brien isn't going to, change the world Mm -hmm. phil snyder isn't going to change the world but jesus is changing the world Mm -hmm. and he is doing that through us so i think there's a little nuance here um he's doing it through us but in the sense that like let's say i'm going to cook dinner and my thumb Mm -hmm. is going to do it all by itself like Mm -hmm. not going to be a thing right because every part of my faculties is needed to cook dinner i need to be able to walk around the kitchen i need both of my hands i need my eyes i need my nose Mm -hmm. i need my sense of taste i need my mind to be like it all has to work together in order to make a meal. Um, and probably I ne- actually definitely I need outside help because I'm going to rely on the farmers that yeah. made the food, right? All these different ways that, that yeah. I can't make the electric on company my to power your stove. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like all these things. exactly. Yeah. Um, and it's easy to think that I'm self-reliant because yeah, I'm going to make dinner by myself. Right. But that's not true. Like I'm relying mm-hmm. on so much and there's so many assumptions underneath. I'm going to make dinner by myself. Yeah. Um, And I think it just pushes us further and further into community where we realize the thumb isn't meant to do anything on its own. The thumb works with the whole hand. The hand is working with, it needs the arm to move it around that, you know, the whole body Mm -hmm. is necessary. And so Christ has left, left his body on earth as he rules from the heavens um, to do his work on earth, to change the world. But it's, it's a community, it's a family, Mm -hmm. it's a, it's a body changing the world and we're not changing the world in the sense that we're building the kingdom we're changing the world in the sense that we're acting the way he would act if he was here as a community mm-hmm. and one day he's going to come back as the head to to fulfill that to finally accomplish that mission and when we get ahead of ourselves and say the church is the only hope of the world and we leave Jesus out of it and eschatology out of it and Jesus's return out of it what we're doing is we're placing our faith and our trust in ourselves as an institution in the body without the head right Mm. um and i think i think keeping our hope as the forefront of our imagination even keeping our hope at the forefront is um crucial because it it allows jesus to be the head that he is 
um, that one day he's going to return. He's going to change the world. And what a blessing, what an opportunity that we get to be a part of it, right? He, he calls mm-hmm. us to be his body on earth. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's a little nuance in that, that we are changing the world, but we're doing it as the body of someone else. We're not doing it as us, right? Mm. I, I'm totally in agreement. And I think one of the nuances, at least for someone like me, and I think for a lot of us who, who have the background that I do, is I'm going to go back to your cooking analogy because I thought it was really, really good. Awesome. And so like, if I'm, if I'm the nose, you yeah. know what I mean, inside of this cooking situation, my focus only needs to be mm. on the aromas and making sure nothing's burning, <laughs> you know, and that I've, we've got the right seasonings as it relates to the nose. And it, it doesn't mean I can't be, you know, noses aren't, this is where the metaphor falls apart, but we move on. It doesn't mean we can't be cognizant of the dinner being cooked or the world is going to be changed in the future. But if we get so focused on what's to come in the sense, so, or the, sorry, if we get so focused on what the byproduct of our work is, Right. Versus our work. I think we, we go astray. And I think we do that. I think mm. I think we're oftentimes a bunch of body parts that want to cut ourselves free of the rest of the body yeah. and be the one to, you know, accomplish the goal on our own. And that's where I came from. And I didn't it, it wouldn't have been something I understood in myself consciously. But I think the years and the years and the years of being told that I can change the world, that I can make a difference, not the, the nuance is, and this is where maturity comes in, it's not that that's wrong or evil. It's not that it's a sinful thing, but it's it lacks the wisdom and the focus mm. of mature following Jesus. And it becomes easy to fall into sin, uh, like hubris yeah. and pride. And it becomes easy to justify disobedience to the Lord. That's right. Uh, not willing to love our neighbor because yeah. we have this bigger vision in our mind. Or even to justify stepping on people mm-hmm. as you climb the stairway to changing the world you'll you're hey, willing to. i've got the metrics that show me that i've reached ten thousand people so of course destroying yeah. your life right doesn't is, right you know, for sure collateral damage right right um but no right we know that's wickedness mm-hmm. and we we part know it's wickedness because our focus my focus shouldn't be on changing the world again not that it's wrong it's just unwise it, yeah. it's kind of immature i'm learning yeah, <laughs> i would yeah. not have been able to use that language a while ago mm. but now i'm like man like i need to be someone who takes and in using the language that i understood from uh, andy crouch's book i need to be someone who looks the culture that i i'm around and can influence it's probably gonna be a very small you know section of that and he uses two different um, terms that i'd love to share and when in relationship to culture, he says to be curators, that means kind of like um, removing what is good, promoting or removing what is bad, promoting what is good. You know what I mean? Like taking the culture that exists and pruning it um, to the best of our ability to reach towards that kingdom to come and that kingdom mindset. Uh, and, and to be creators, to be creators of culture, which is what we're doing, for example, like on this podcast, we're, we're making a small bit of culture, mm-hmm. just a little bit, and we're offering it up into the world. and. That's all we're called to do, right. you know, to positively impact the little community that we have um, through things like this, but also through the, the, you know, when we say culture, I'm talking about, you know, my neighborhood, the people who are in my ecclesiastical kind of church that, that I do life with, investing in, taking care of them. That could be taking the culture that we influence at our workplace, whether that is at a, a supermarket or whether that's at some nine to five in an office, right, with a cubicle or whatever it is, to take what we have and to to do our best to prune and to create in a way that changes the culture we can influence, not the world, just the culture we can influence, to align just a little bit, just a little bit more with the kingdom that's to come. Because I think that's our, as part of the body, that, that's all the focus we need to be. Knowing that the Lord is, to use your cooking analogy, cooking up something special, <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know, uh, and we don't need to be in charge of that or even thinking about it or analyzing metrics to assess it. Mm-hmm. Um, right. we can it's an upside be, down kingdom. It if is we, an upside down. Even if we analyze the metrics, we're probably going to get it wrong because we're going to be looking for big and flashy mm-hmm. and, and probably what he's doing is planting mustard seeds yep. that go completely unnoticed until the tree starts to sprout, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. We should note, by the way, we're not anti-analytics. 
Yeah. By the way. Yeah. <laughs> we right. just we can take those analytics and we allow them to focus us in on just our particular community. Yeah. And we keep our focus on how are these helping indicate whether or not we're loving and serving our neighbors. Yeah. But I think all the data. I do think that that our our ideas of change are often influenced by I think we think in metaphors. Mm-hmm. And I think mm-hmm. our metaphors mm-hmm. for change are often construction metaphors or economic metaphors. So we think about metrics and data and when we're looking for big we're looking for return on investment right and the great um, commission all right go out and make all the sales yeah exactly right um so we're looking for big numbers or with construction metaphors we're looking mm-hmm. to have a plan and we're looking to build it up brick by brick mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. and i love that you're talking about culture um i don't know that there's actually a tie here but it strikes me that the word culture and cultivate are probably related Maybe. um and and i think that when god first gave the human commission um, to Adam and Eve and said, you know, tend the garden and, and take the garden yeah. to the world and in essence, rule over the creatures, mm-hmm. subdue the land. Um, he's essentially calling them to be really good farmers and to, yeah. to, to make animals and land prosper far beyond their boundaries. Yep. Um, and yeah, so they were meant to be culture makers, cultivators. Did you read the book? No. This is a big chunk of the book. You oh, like, is it? Yeah, you're nailing it. Perfect. Yeah. I love yeah. it. Love it. You don't even need to read it. Yeah. Well, I probably have been influenced by it. I've heard a lot of people talk mm-hmm. about it. Um, and I should read it, but um, yeah, I think we're meant to be cultivators. Um, mm-hmm. And so, changing our metaphors. Speaking of changing our metaphors, you you earlier mentioned the difference between change and impact. Um, mm-hmm. So can you yeah. can you enlighten us on that a little bit? Not in the book. This is just something I've been thinking about. Okay. Um, and uh, for me, I've been thinking about the idea of change. Gives me a lot of credit for being able to come in and I don't think this is necessarily the exact definition of the word. This is our, I think, social definition of the word. This is how we understand the word. If I say change the world, I mean uh, radically transform it in a way that's been influenced with my image, which is really what we mean. Um, And by impact, it just means to positively influence and acknowledge that that might be a very small impact. We might just move. We don't necessarily change the, the world culture. We just move it. Uh, closer or further away from the kingdom. Uh, again, that's just like an imagery that's been helpful for yeah. me saying, okay, in my community, how do I impact, but just move things a little bit closer to the kingdom? And if I, for me, I've been thinking about the parable quite a bit, a faithful with little, faithful with much, you know, those yeah. who are faithful with what the king gave them, they were, they were rewarded with more. I think, I think that has some, maybe not um, one-to-one correlation, but there's some level of correlation between you know, if I am responsible with the little bit of influence the Lord's given me in my community, he may, not will, may, right. just may choose to uh, give me more influence in this world. But even if he does, I shouldn't be aiming for that. What I really should be aiming for is that greater reward in the kingdom to come. And that's a huge theme in the whole Sermon on the Mount and many of Jesus' parables. Right. And uh, so it is true that if I'm faithful with this small community that I'm given, it's possible the Lord may allow and choose to think it's wise. But honestly, I think if I'm doing, if I'm, if I'm loving and impacting my community in a way that really does honor the Lord, my heart will move to my community even more and more and more. And I actually won't want to change the world along to deepen my connection to my community. Right. And um, just like most things, you know, we're just noticing, I think, as a world that scale does not work, right? right? Um, That instead of having, you know, efficiency. um, Oh, here's an easy example. You know how, like, so many churches are moving, like, there was a big push in, like, early 2000s with um, satellite campuses for larger churches. Um, Well-intentioned, right? Like, Hey, where this church is growing, and we know that this that this pastor is really effective as a teacher of the word. Um, and so, how about you know, instead of being able to like raise up another pastor, like or teacher, I should say, we'll give them a local shepherd and a and a band. But we can now have this sermon, you know, thirty miles away in some school, you know, or whatever it is. And, and so many churches are like like backing out of that as fast as possible, right? Because it just didn't have maybe the results. I mean, it did for a time, but I don't think it it gave what we all knew was really needed for these communities, which is intentional, long-term commitment from all of the leaders and 
uh, individuals who go to these ecclesiastical church communities to be invested in their communities. At the end of the day, how can you really preach to a town you've never <clears> visited <throat> or you don't know their problems or yeah, um, that kind of thing? And it asks the question, and we've had this conversation before, mm-hmm. but what is a church? Is a church a place to go and mm-hmm. get a TED Talk, or is a church a place where... Yeah. where it depends how good the TED Talk is, man. Exactly right. <laughs> just kidding. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this might just be semantics to anybody listening, but yeah. our listeners should know that we both have English literature degrees. <laughs> so semantics uh, is what we do. <laughs> so semantics is, is big for us. Um, and you use this word, as you were describing impact, which I totally agree with your point, but as you were describing impact, you use the word influence a couple times. Um, and I actually like the word influence better than impact because yeah. what is an impact, but something striking something yeah. else and then rippling out. Right. And I sure. think, I think kind of the suddenness and spon- spontaneity of, of mm-hmm. impact, um, along with, you know, impact is a big, still a big word, yeah, uh, influence but, my community. But yeah, I think influence mm. is just kind of this gentle, mm. be a part of so that you can have influence in, like you can't influence what you're not connected to. Right. Um, so maybe there's an even better word. Than, yeah, I like than influence, but you used it several times. And I was thinking, I think that that even gets more to the heart of what you're saying, um, that rather than trying to change things and maybe we shouldn't even mm-hmm. be trying to influence, but just, you know, trying to be faithful, trying to be loyal to, to Jesus, trying yeah. to have our allegiance solely to him. And then watching the, the slow, gentle ripples of a faithful mm-hmm. life. Um, what's Eugene Peterson's line about a life lived in the right direction, um, I'm getting that line oh, wrong, but what is it? O- o- obedience uh, is walking in the right direction for a long period of time, or something along those lines. Googling so, again, we got this mathematical formula about you, about, um, <laughs> about obedience. Um, but yeah, I think I think the small ripples are are what we're what we're after. We're after dropping dropping pebbles into streams rather than trying to create tsunamis. Long obedience in the same direction. There it is. There, thereby results and has always resulted in the long run, something which has made life worth living. Mm. That's good. That's really good. That was worth the time it took to look up. You're welcome, world. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Uh, All right, Nick. We got to wrap this show up because we have baked potatoes to eat. That's right. Okay. Concluding statement. Oh, putting me on the spot. Oh, yeah. do it. What no, it ha- ha- summarize our whole conversation in one sentence. <laughs> no problem. <Yeah. laughs> I'm, I'm going to change the world with the next thing that yeah, yeah. comes out of my mouth. <laughs> no, yeah. I, I just think I just think our hope and our allegiance need to be solely in Jesus Christ. Yeah, who is changing the world and is changing us from the inside out. Um, but I think you can justify a lot of damage and a lot of hubris and be, be mm. malformed um, when your emphasis is on I or my institution is going to change the world. Yeah. Um, I, I hinted at this earlier, but I think if we're right, this is a podcast about how am I shaped by? Mm. And so how am I shaped by thinking I'm going to change the world or even this institution I'm a part of, or this organization I give to or, or whatever is going to change the world. Um, I think that would shape us to have a larger view of ourselves than we should mm. um, to start to think of ourselves as heroes and saviors. Mm. Um, whereas thinking, how can I be faithful to Jesus who is changing the world? How can I be faithful to him while he does that work? And how can I work for him and on be- his behalf? Um, I think that shapes me to keep Jesus in, in the mm. seat where he belongs on the throne where he belongs as King. Mm. I think that shapes me to think less of myself and lift others up. I think it shapes me to be more entrenched in my community versus having my eyes set on how big can I get so I can make the biggest difference possible. Mm. Um, and so if we want to be shaped to be upside down kingdom mustard seed kind of people, I think we ought to think of ourselves as, as a part of the story Jesus is telling in the world versus thinking of ourselves as these big difference makers. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of the Living Room Disciple Podcast, where I got to process through some of my millennial issues. You're welcome. Uh, You can always support us on Patreon. Just go to livingroomdisciple.com for more information on how to do that and more information about who we are and what we're doing. Thank you so much to Anissa Live for all the amazing production work, to Eric Church for getting this episode out into the world, and to Daniel Ramirez for composing the music for today's episode. Thank you so much for joining us today on Living a Disciple Podcast, where discipleship finds a home.